Hello, Mammalogy. Um, welcome to our last lecture for this semester. Um, so I wish we could be doing this in person, but um, I'm hoping to see all your smiling faces in the fall. Um, so uh, next week, you guys, instead of listening to me talk on Zoom, you will be listening to each other talk on Zoom about the life history of the Colorado mammals that you have chosen. So that's what's on the docket for, for next week. Um, but our topic here uh, for the last lecture is uh, conservation biology and particularly conservation of mammals. Um, so uh, as I'm sure you guys mostly know, um, we are in the sixth mass extinction event that we have recorded over uh, geological time. Um, extinction is a uh, natural process. It's a normal uh, fact of life. It's 99% um, of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. Um, so it's not unusual for species to go extinct. What is unusual is the rate at which species are going extinct currently. And um, the, the rate at which they're going extinct is comparable to some of these mass extinction events that we've seen in the past, um, where very large proportions of uh, life on the planet have gone extinct uh, over relatively short periods of time. Now, those historic mass extinction events were often caused by catastrophic events like an asteroid striking the planet, um, as happened in the KT extinction um, at, the, uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period, where um, all of the dinosaurs, except for birds, uh, went extinct. Um, but uh, it's what's happening now, the extinction event that we're in now is different because it's being caused by humans. Um, and so the, that makes it, well, I feel that that makes it uh, partially our moral responsibility to be concerned with the ex extinction since our species is causing these things to happen. Um, now, mammals uh, are particularly sensitive uh, to uh, human populations because oftentimes they are in conflict with humans. Um, so if you look at um, the biomass of mammals currently on the planet, about 60% of the biomass of mammals on the planet is domestic mammals. So cows, pigs, sheep, whatnot. About another 36% of the biomass of mammals on the planet is humans. That leaves only about 4% of the biomass of mammals that are wild mammals. So we are already um, edging out a lot of these wild mammals um, and causing many of them to become extinct. Um, in fact, scientists, some scientists estimate that by 2050, uh, just another 30 years from now, uh, as many as 50% of current mammals, current animals, current organisms uh, could be extinct. So this is a, it's very dramatic. Um, it's happening very rapidly. And um, it's something that, that uh, we, we maybe should be concerned about. And part of the reason why it's happening now is because that um, humans are uh, increasing in population quite rapidly and we use a lot of resources. So ecologically speaking, um, there's only a certain amount of resources in any particular ecosystem, a certain amount of energy that's available for heterotrophs or animals that have to eat, or animals are a heterotroph, but organisms that have to eat other organisms in order to live. Um, there's only a certain amount of energy in those trophic food chains. And right now we are monopolizing uh, huge swaths of the available biomass to support our very large population, whether that is through direct eating of primary productivity, so eating plants, or eating animals that we raise that eat plants. Um, so we are uh, monopolizing a vast majority of the available resources. And so the question is, if these animals go extinct, in the past when we've had these mass extinction events, they were followed by a rapid radiation of new species that were moving into those available niches. The difference here is that humans are filling all of the niches. And so there might not be any um, available niches for new species to radiate into after we have this mass extinction event. So it's unclear whether um, given the human population that biodiversity will rebound in this scenario. So it's, it's quite different from previous mass extinction events. 
<clears throat> so if you're looking at species declines um, and human caused species declines, um, there's a number of factors that humans do cause uh, that you might be looking at. These are what we might call, or what I like to call, human-induced rapid environmental change, or HIREC. So um, we come into uh, areas and we change the environment. And we change the environment either directly or um, sometimes we don't do it on purpose and in indirect manner. So the biggest uh, type of human-induced rapid environmental change is habitat loss. So oftentimes we move into uh, an ecosystem and we convert habitat from the current state to agriculture or urbanization, um, things like that. So that the habitat that animals are relying on um, is lost. So that's the probably the biggest cause of species decline is utilization of the habitat by humans for other purposes. Um, the other big thing that, that we do that has impacted many species is over exploitation. So that's when um, humans make direct use of a mammal um, in the wild. Uh, usually this is in the example, the example that people would give would be hunting. So um, over hunting a population such that we are removing individuals from that population more rapidly than they can be replaced by reproduction, which causes the populations to decline. So any animal that has a economic value is um, potentially subject to overexploitation. Um, introduced species is another possible cause of population decline. Um, humans travel all over the planet and when we move, we tend to move other animals with us. And sometimes those animals move into habitats where the native mammals in those areas are not adapted to these introduced species and that can cause um, those native mammal populations to decline because of negative interactions with the introduced species. Um, then there's pollution. So pollution is any type of man-made uh, substance in the environment that has a negative impact. Um, so generally we're talking about chemical pollution. Um, but there are some other examples of pollution. Um, you can look at light pollution or sound pollution um, as well. And then of course, climate change. So as uh, the planet is warming due to uh, human emissions of carbon dioxide, um, the overall climate of the planet is changing very rapidly. And for many mammals, they may not have the ability to adapt to those changing climactic um, conditions and that can also cause population declines and potentially extinctions. So we're going to go through each of these and look at some examples. All right, so habitat destruction is by far the biggest um, cause of population declines in, in mammalian species. Um, a lot of that's going to be because of clear cutting um, and particularly in areas where you have high biodiversity. So in those tropical forests in, um, you know, near the equator, uh, with really high biodiversity, clearing of those forests can cause and has caused extinction events. Um, but also clearing of grasslands for agriculture or um, other types of habitat destruction can also cause population declines. Um, the example that I have here is uh, the rainforest of, of uh, Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar is a large island off the coast of Africa that has been uh, geographically set, isolated from the rest of the African continent for an extended period of time. So it has a lot of unique species that are found only in Madagascar and nowhere else in the world. So for example, lemurs, which is a group of primates, are found only in Madagascar. Um, there's, there's 100 known species of lemurs. Um, we uh, occasionally find new species because those forests have not been very well explored. And so um, sometimes they do find these new primate species in there. Um, but of the uh, 100 known, currently known species of lemur, um, there, there are 92 of them are either endangered, vulnerable, or we don't have enough information to know whether their populations are declining. Um, only 8% of lemur species are considered to be doing um, okay, um, so that that's a, a pretty major decline in a very large group of animals, um, and that's largely due to deforestation of their habitat. These are mostly arboreal species, 
And um, as the forests have been cleared, as you can see in this figure here, um, there's just not habitat for them to survive. Um, okay, over exploitation. Um, the, we, historically, we've done a lot of this in mammals. Um, so any mammal that has an economic value um, has been hunted. So the fur trade um, caused many species to nearly become extinct. Uh, one example of that is sea otters. Um, they actually did think that sea otters were extinct and until um, two small populations of sea otters were discovered in um, uh, Central California coast and uh, Alaska. Um, they since have recovered significantly, but um, they, they were hunted for their fur because their fur is both very warm, very soft, and waterproof. So it was a, a very hot commodity um, for a, a long period of time. Um, hunting of sea otters has since been banned and they, they are starting to recover. Um, a current problem is uh, in the rhinoceros and there have been several subspecies of rhinoceros that have been driven extinct because of poaching. Uh, for the rhinoceros, the, um, the item that's of economic value is actually their horn, which is a traditional medicine in some cultures uh, for um, impotence and infertility. It's supposed to, uh, it's basically like a Viagra of the natural world. Um, uh, we have a, dog in here who I brought in so that he wouldn't barge, but now he's barking to go out. Because you can't make it easy. Okay. Um, uh, so the, the real kicker though about rhinoceros horn is that it's made of keratin. It's the same stuff that your fingernails and your hair is made of. There's nothing magical about rhinoceros horn. That being said, um, you can get uh, thousands of dollars per gram of powdered rhinoceros horn. And so um, these horns are worth literally tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and that economic incentive is so strong that um, people with little other economic prospects will take a lot of risks and are very willing to do illegal things to um, kill and harvest uh, rhinoceros horns. Um, so um, they've tried doing things uh, like surgically removing the horn. Um, however, the, the, it turns out the horn is really important for protection from predators and individuals, uh, it's particularly females without the horn, are not very well able to protect their young. Um, so it is a, it's a, a serious issue that um, is really, really not a great situation. Um, a lot of these rhinoceros are protected in um, parks in Africa, and there are, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, like park rangers or, or you know, wildlife managers who are trying to protect these rhinoceros. They're literally, they have to literally go armed everywhere they go and the poachers uh, will not hesitate to actually assassinate um, these park rangers in order to get to the uh, rhinoceros, which is it's a really sad situation. Um, okay, introduced species. Um, oftentimes uh, the introduced species is not as intentional that these cause population declines. But um, when they're when to introduce species move into a new habitat, oftentimes the animals that are there either can't compete or are directly harmed by those introduced species. Um, and humans are really good at moving things around. So a couple of examples, um, uh, human, the, the early humans who arrived in Australia actually brought uh, a domesticated dog with them. Those dogs went feral and became dingoes. Um, and so dingoes are now a wild species of dog that live in Australia. Um, and uh, they outcompeted most of the large marsupial carnivores that used to live on that continent. So now the large marsupial carnivores like the Tasmanian tiger, which is pictured here, and Tasmanian devils, they have that name because dingoes never made it to Tasmania, an island off the southern coast of, of Australia. And so these um, marsupial carnivores are now restricted only to Tasmania. Um, another example here, uh, this is the this guy down here that looks kind of like a, a guinea pig. That's a Hispaniolan 
Hutia. Um, it's a, a tree dwelling rodent. Um, and they are uh, critically endangered largely because they are preyed upon by introduced mongoose that were brought to the island, um, to the island of Hispaniola, which is where Haiti and the Dominican Republic are. Um, they, the mongoose were brought there by humans to help control uh, another introduced species, um, the black rat, which was decimating sugarcane plantations. And so they introduced the mongoose to control the rats, but of course mongoose don't just eat rats, they eat lots of other things. And so these native rodents of the island um, have been driven nearly to extinction by the mongoose. All right, pollution, also a, a very big issue, uh, particularly in aquatic environments. Um, oftentimes that's because these pollutants do run down into waterways and um, get into these aquatic environments where they can bioaccumulate up the food chain. Um, so one example of a pollutant that's particularly problematic for mammals is um, PCBs, which is a, uh, a compound that um, comes from a number of different uh, human processes and um, it accumulates in uh, fatty tissues um, and it's a very big problem for marine mammals. In fact, um, when they've compared the PCB levels to beached marine mammals versus um, healthy marine mammals that are free swimming, um, they find that um, oftentimes those beached animals have much higher PCB levels than um, animals that are healthier. That indicates that the PCBs could be changing their behavior, um, causing them to beach more frequently, uh, potentially causing other physiological problems that um, are, are impacting these animals. Um, so that's an example of a chemical pollutant. Um, another example uh, is uh, toxoplasmosis. Um, so um, toxoplasmosis or to uh, toxoplasma is a very common parasite of domestic cats. And uh, this is why the toxo toxoplasma is why um, they advise that pregnant women do not clean litter boxes is because it exposes them to this parasite, which can be harmful to the pregnancy. Um, but um, many outdoor cats that are pooping outside somewhere uh, have toxoplasma and that toxoplasma actually runs off when it rains from the poop uh, into waterways, into the ocean, and it's um, the sea otters that live in the ocean have very, very little resistance to toxoplasma. And while it won't kill a cat, it can kill sea otters. And so it, um, uh, there's been a lot of sea otter deaths that are due to runoff from cat poop um, of domestic cats. So um, it's another example of, no, that one's not a chemical, that would actually be a disease, but um, it still counts as pollution that's related to humans because it's our pets that are the problem. All right. Um, all right, and then our last one, climate change. Um, so it's pretty clear that we are in a rapidly warming world. Um, so here's, this is some data for you looking at uh, overall global temperature. Um, if you were born after 1980, you have not experienced a below average temperature year in your entire life. Um, and uh, it's at the, you can look at the correlation between carbon dioxide and, and global temperatures. And it's, it's pretty clear that we've, we've got an issue with this. Um, and this also appears to be, um, the rate of climate change appears to be increasing quite rapidly as well. So we're in a scenario where um, we are dealing with um, some very quickly changing environmental conditions. Um, so the poster child, of course, for the impacts of climate change are polar bears. Um, and any species that lives either um, at high latitudes or at high altitudes, are potentially um, gonna be more sensitive to climate change. So an animal that you might be worried about in Colorado are pika. Um, pika, those cute little meeping critters that live up at the tops of our mountains. Um, they're uh, a lagomorph and they're super cute. Um, but they're extremely sensitive to heat stress. And if we continue to have our um, increasing temperatures, uh, it's particularly at high elevation, those guys would might be get to the point where um, it's just too hot for them to survive. Um, so that's 
one example, but um, the more common example is polar bears, which are very, very dependent on sea ice. So this, this picture at the bottom here is showing the, um, the minimum range of sea ice between 1979 and 2018. Um, so the sea ice is shrinking by about 9% per year. And normally polar bears are very dependent on sea ice for foraging. Um, so they, uh, they, um, um, they forage for seals that haul out onto the ice. And um, that's a really important food resource for them. And when there's not, not enough sea ice, they have to go to land and they're not as effective hunters on land. Um, so they often will uh, resort instead to feeding on human waste in garbage dumps. And that puts them in much closer contact with humans. And as you, I'm sure know, uh, whenever a predator comes in close contact with humans, there's often human animal conflict and usually the animal loses that, um, that conflict because we have guns and they don't. Um, so polar bear populations are declining very rapidly. Um, we're seeing a lot of malnutrition in polar bears that we weren't seeing before and it's pretty a tragic, tragic situation. All right, so all of these are reasons why populations might decline in the first place, but once you get small populations, then you have uh, other pro problems that can arise that can lead to even worse problems. So for example, if the population crashes and you go down to a very small population, that population is gonna be susceptible to genetic drift. And genetic drift can cause loss of genetic diversity, um, which, um, can lead to uh, all kinds of inbreeding problems where you have um, deleterious alleles in the population that become very common by random chance. Um, there's, very, there's a lot of support looking at, uh, for example, sperm quality in some of these very small mammalian populations. And there's all kinds of sperm abnormalities that arise um, in small populations that are due primarily to genetic drift. Um, so this can be a real problem for a lot of these popula populations. And the thing with having low genetic diversity is that uh, once your genetic diversity is low, even if you're able to get the population to increase again, there's nowhere for, that, for new genetic variation to come from. And so the, the genetic variability will remain low for an extended period of time. This makes these populations more susceptible to disease, um, and it can be a real problem. So one example of this is the southern elephant seal. Um, their population got down to about 100 individuals. And uh, while their population has recovered because we stopped hunting them, um, they are now extremely genetically similar to each other. So if a, if a disease gets in that could infect um, the southern elephant seal, it's, it's likely that there wouldn't be enough genetic variation in the population for them to uh, have some individuals who are resistant to that disease. Um, so it's a big problem in the future. Um, so this kind of leads to this idea of the extinction vortex, um, where you get down to a, you get down below a critical level of population, and it just leads to the spiral that then leads to extinction. So you have a small population, which leads to inbreeding and more drift and loss of genetic variability and lower fitness, which leads to a smaller population, which leads to more inbreeding. And um, once a, a population enters this spiral, this extinction vortex, it's extremely difficult to recover them. Um, so one species, for example, that is uh, hypothesized to be experiencing an extinction vortex at the moment is the Iberian lynx, which is a, a big cat found in Spain. Um, their, their populations are very small and they're experiencing very serious inbreeding problems. But if there are no other populations, it's very hard to introduce genetic diversity and very hard to recover these populations. So it's a, it's a really big problem. Okay, so what can we do? What conservation efforts do we have? Um, for mammals, one of the really big conservation efforts is wildlife reserves. So putting aside land uh, habitat, um, and particularly for a lot of the larger charismatic mammals that people really care about, um, they require large areas. So you have to dedicate large areas of suitable habitat for these animals. Um, and so wildlife reserves are a really big part of that. Um, also, international treaties do help um, 
if you can, especially for animals that cross international boundaries, if you can get a bunch of nations to agree that we want to protect a particular animal, then that um, can really help. So this picture here of these, uh, all these dudes signing a, a thing, um, that is the, um, the, the International Whale Treaty that banned the harvest of whales in 1946. Um, which is the only reason why we have whales. Whales were nearly hunted to extinction, um, but uh, there was a huge international effort to to get all of these countries to agree not to hunt whales anymore. So now there's only two countries that still hunt whales for scientific purposes. Um, those would be Iceland and Japan. Um, and then also uh, people of uh, native uh, heritage who uh, traditionally have relied on whaling as part of their um, their culture uh, are still allowed to whale but the the native peoples really only take like a couple of whale per year um, and so that's a kind of a sustainable level of harvest um, commercial whaling with and and they they whale from human powered boats with like harpoons and spears so it's not like they're not using a lot of technology to take these animals whereas the Japanese whalers that are still doing it for scientific purposes um, really have a kind of an unfair advantage with motor powered boats and um, you know modern weapons to try and catch these animals. Um, the other thing that's really big of course is banning the trading of um, products that are made from endangered species. Um, so there's, there's now an international ban on the trading of, of elephant ivory. Um, this picture on the top here is um, uh, destruction of confiscated ivory. So they basically put it all through a wood chipper um, to destroy it, so to take it out of circulation. Um, and um, that's, and the other thing that, that's been really big with ivory trade in particular is to try to make ivory, instead of being a desired status product, to make it a shameful product if you have this ivory that it's, it's um, something that's considered that's looked down upon rather than something that's revered and then the other thing is to is to uh instead of making the animal have value when it's dead make the animal have value when it's alive so ecotourism has been huge for conservation so in, when people travel to a location to observe animals then that um, promotes the people who live there to protect those animals rather than um to take those animals uh, either for food or for products that they can get from the animal. Uh, because the animal now has more value alive and protected than it would have dead. So ecotourism is a really, really uh, powerful tool for concert, conserving species. In terms of species that have already declined significantly, um, we do have a lot of captive breeding attempts. Um, so there's a, a number of species that um, are being captively bred to, to increase the populations of those species so they don't go extinct. So for example, uh, one of my early field jobs actually was at um, the uh, breeding, the, the, the Smithsonian Zoological Breeding Center in Front Royal, Virginia. I was actually doing a project out there looking at the effects of deer overpopulation on, on um, ecosystems. But um, it was kind of neat because we'd be driving around the facility and there'd be all these weird ungulates and they had quoll and they had all these cool critters that they were um, breeding in captivity to try and increase native populations. Um, for Colorado, one of the classic examples is the black-footed ferret. This is a species that relies on prairie dogs um, they live in prairie dog towns and prairie dogs are their main food source. Um, so with the decline of prairie dogs in recent years, black-footed ferrets have, have declined. They're also extremely susceptible to disease, um, particularly distemper and also the plague. Um, and they thought that the black-footed ferret had gone extinct. Um, and then they found a small colony of like uh, 30 or so individuals. They brought them into captivity and tried to breed them, but they didn't realize that they were susceptible to distemper and um, the whole captive population got distemper and died. And so they thought they had brought these animals into captivity and then killed them all. Fortunately, they found another small population of black-footed ferrets and like now black-footed ferret 
uh, captive breeding is so tightly locked down, you basically have to wear like a biohazard suit to get in to where they are keeping the ferrets because they're protecting the ferrets from you, not because you're being protected from the ferrets. Um, and uh, that, that second attempt has actually been very successful and they've reintroduced black-footed ferrets. That's our next topic here is reintroductions. They've reintroduced black-footed ferrets to a number of different habitats, including um, there's some ferrets up on the Walker Ranch, just north of Pueblo. Um, so they have actually been, been successful in reintroducing those guys to the wild. Um, another reintroduction um, example that you may have heard about um, is the, uh, the wolf reintroduction to Yellowstone. That was a very successful reintroduction uh, where wolves have become very well established and are actually spreading throughout um, the Northwestern states. Um, and uh, so reintroductions have variable levels of success. Um, and then the other thing that we often do when we're looking at species in the wild is to do what we call population viability analyses, where you um, measure reproductive output and survival rates, and you can actually build models um, that can take into, th into account things like environmental variability and look at the probability of populations persisting over time. Um, so that's all I've got for this lecture. Um, hope you all are doing well, and I will uh, be seeing you next week on your Zoom videos. Okay.